Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. I'm Pamela Lavitt, the Director of Arts and Ideas and the Seattle Jewish Film Festival. Don't you love these Zoom backgrounds where you sometimes have hair and sometimes don't. Um, I am so excited that you're all joining us. This is one of the things that I truly love about the film festival is the opportunity to have extended conversation with filmmakers. Um, even though we love live theater in the movies and in the uh, theater zones that we have been in for the last week, these are the great deeper conversations that we get to have. I'm very excited um, in brief to introduce our guests as well as my co-conspirator here today. Um, I have uh, the Washington State Jewish Historical Society here as the community partner and Lisa Kranzler will be joining us. This is a history happy hour, which is something that the Historical Society has been holding for many years. We'll let Lisa tell you all about that. And I'm also very excited to have a filmmaker whose films have appeared in our film festival before. Holy Silence was a film that we had in the film festival a number of years ago. And now we have Stephen Pressman, who is the director of the Levies, I'm sorry, the Levies of Monticello. So you got to remember how to pronounce both of those. Um, so obviously, I just want to say, please join us. We have a number of other Zooms that are coming up. There's another one tomorrow evening, uh, a panel Divorce Denied. And then we have a filmmaker Zoom uh, from a Israeli filmmaker for Savoy on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So you can get up and have your breakfast with us. So with that said, you can also go on to our YouTube channel and tell friends that have seen this film um, that they can also catch this recording later on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome my uh, panelists. Please join us, Director Stephen Pressman and Lisa Kranzler. How wonderful to have you both here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, Thanks we're so, so excited. Um, I, I just wanted to start, Lisa, why don't you just kick us off real quick and tell us a little bit about, and I'm not promoting drinking, this is orange juice, um, but I did want to say it's History Happy Hour. So what is History Happy Hour? Yes, it is. And thank you, Pamela. And thank you, Stephen, for being here. History Happy Hour is a, a platform that we developed, oh my goodness, probably about maybe 15 years ago, and um, it's been going on um, to allow us to delve deeper into basically hear from authors, filmmakers, um, and historians, and many others who are making current history, making relevant history, uh, curating history in any way. And so we're just very thrilled to uh, be here with the film festival and uh, actually also sponsor this tremendous film, uh, Supporting History. So thank you. Thank you. Well, before you start, because I'm going to kick it over to you, I just want to thank our other community partner as well, which is Herzl Nair Tamid Conservative Congregation. And we really appreciate the support of all of our community partners and our sponsors. And without further ado, I'm first going to give it over to the person who really thinks about history all day, all night, even though I have a training in oral history. Um, Lisa, you're immersed in it every day. So maybe you could start by asking Stephen some of the questions that came up for you. Um, about Monticello and is about, you know, what does history, this history mean when you have something that has been hidden for history for so long? Yeah, I mean, thank you so much, Pamela. I'm happy to kick it off and appreciate the opportunity. Um, so Stephen, uh, first of all, the film was fantastic um, and really enjoyed all the, all, the, all the perspective that you gave it. I'm curious, first of all, about how you came to the subject. Um, and that would be my first question. And, and then what research you actually did to uh, to do this, because I know you talked to many people, um, sure. and not only just people you, you interviewed on screen. Sure, Lisa, I'm uh, delighted to be part of this conversation. And yeah, this is it's, it's such a great story. I, you know, a few years back when I was first beginning to work on the levees of Monticello, you know, friends would ask me, you know, what are you working on? And whenever I told them, well, I'm making a film about a Jewish family that owned Monticello. Uh, to a one, they would say, "You got to be kidding me! You're making this up, right?" And of course, I, I wasn't making it up. Um, it's such a great story, um, and um, I came to this project really uh, in large part because um, the the first two films I had made. Uh, Pamela had mentioned one, "Holy Silence." Uh, both of my first two films were uh, based around the Holocaust. So I had spent a number of years immersed in, in that world. And I knew that when, it, when I was ready to start working on a new film, uh, I, 
I've always been interested in finding uh, little known Jewish stories to tell a, as a filmmaker. Uh, but to be honest, I was ready to move beyond that very dark world of, of the Holocaust. Um, and, and that's when a little bit of luck kicked in, to be very honest, because I'll never forget, I was sitting at my home. I've got a little home office in, uh, I live in San Francisco. I was sitting in my home office one day a few years back, and I was just kind of uh, daydreaming and my mind was wandering and my eyes settled on a book that was sitting on a on a bookshelf right above my desk uh, by uh, somebody I had worked with as a journalist many years ago, a terrific uh, author named Mark Liebson, uh, who had written 20 some, 20 some odd years ago, a book called Saving Monticello. Now, I have to admit that even though I had had a copy of Mark's book and that I was vaguely familiar with what it was about, um, I never quite got around to reading it cover to cover. All I knew was that Mark had written many, many years ago about uh, some Jewish family that had something to do with Monticello. Well, I pulled the book off the shelf. I, I, I became a little more acquainted with the story. And I realized that as a filmmaker, all these years later, I had a, I had a unique opportunity to tell a story that, particularly in terms of a documentary film, had never, ever been told before. Uh, and I also realized as I was uh, reading Mark's book, I also had an opportunity uh, to really tell a broader story beyond just the story of the Levy family and their relationship to Monticello. Uh, and that's the reason why the film, while it focuses on the Levy family, really also tells a broader story about, unfortunately, the very long history of anti-Semitism that that runs throughout the course of American history. And so when I combined those two themes together, I had this uh, great opportunity to tell a story that is really news to a lot of people watching the film, the story of the Levies uh, and their ownership and preservation of Monticello, while also telling that broader story uh, about, uh, about anti-Semitism throughout American history. Right. I, thank you so much. I mean, I think that's what made it so re entirely relevant to today. And in terms of, um, you know, I'm just wondering how you were able to discover so much about the um, the anti-Semitism, perhaps that uh, Uriah Levy, you know, was involved with in terms of his, I know you mentioned um, in the Navy and all. And so I'm, I'm curious about how that. Sure, came sure. You know, for me as a filmmaker, uh, I, I before I became a filmmaker, I spent many years as a journalist. Uh, I've always loved doing the research. I always love interviewing people, talking to people, asking questions. And as somebody who has now made uh, a, a, a few historical documentaries, the research part is always, to me, one of the most interesting aspects of, of filmmaking. And so here, of course, I uh, once again have that opportunity to do that, digging through old records, you know, everything from looking at old newspaper articles, uh, journals, and, and, and documents that, that often help sort of to bring history alive all these decades and, and centuries later. And there was a great opportunity to do that in telling the story of, of the levees. Uh, the, as, as people who have seen the film know, uh, the, the film really focuses on two different generations of the Levy family. You mentioned Uriah Levy, the original Jewish owner of Monticello, uh, this rare breed, a Jewish career naval officer, spends 50 years in the US Navy, uh, subject to constant anti-Semitism throughout the course of his career. He winds up getting court-martialed six times, really for no other reason than the fact that he was a Jew uh, and that he had to live with this anti-Semitism. And so uh, everything from talking to historians, I mentioned Mark Liebson, who wrote the book many years ago. Uh, there's another former uh, university professor, Mel Yurofsky, who had also done some writing and some research in this, uh, in this area. So talking to people like that, talking to historians, digging through old uh, newspaper archives, to me, that's always the fun part of telling these stories and, and discovering, discovering little tidbits about these stories that, that help, bring, help bring the story alive. Um, I'm sure we'll get into this a little later in our conversation, but I also realized early on that in addition to focusing on anti-Semitism, 
Um, when, whenever you're talking about a subject like Monticello, uh, it's also quite honestly impossible to tell a story about Monticello without also talking about uh, the unfortunate and sad story of slavery and the role that enslaved people played. And in this case, unfortunately, not only during Thomas Jefferson's days, a somewhat more familiar story, but also in the early years that Monticello was owned by Uriah Levy, who also had enslaved people working for him. So there was additional research that I needed to do to become much more familiar with the history of slavery uh, after Thomas Jefferson dies. Uh, you know, I sometimes joke uh, about this, this, this film because when people think they're going to see a film about Thomas Jefferson in Monticello, mm -hmm. I, I sometimes tell people uh, that, well, as a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson dies within the first five minutes of the film. Um, so it's not it's not a film about Thomas Jefferson, but it is a film about the house that he loved, and it is and it is a film about the family, the Levy family, that is responsible for saving it from ruin on two different occasions. But it is also a story about slavery, and much of the film focuses on that as well. Right, and I thank you for saying that. Was actually my next question, but it was really quite interesting about. It. You're putting that perspective in, you know, from people that um, that you that were speaking about that, you know, specifically. So I thought that that was quite an interesting perspective to tell the story through that through that lens. So yeah, thank you for bringing that. And I just a plug, a quick plug for for history sake and putting all the do, you know having all those that those documents and clippings and newspaper articles and stories available to you um i know that you know people don't realize how much goes into the making of a, of a documentary like this so i'm for one i'm very appreciative um and uh i think that um pamela has a few uh additional questions for you um so i can hand this back over to her Good. Thanks, Lisa. I love getting the history people to be in conversation because I'm I'm sure you can keep going. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone who's listening to is I know Seattleites are shy about speaking up and it is a webinar, but we do love questions. And I think that probably um, asking those will, will make for a much richer conversation. So I'm really encouraging our community to step in and ask questions. You can do it through the Q&A or through the chat. Um, so I, I just wanted to pick up on, on the thread of this story, which was about a family that, you know, slave owners, and yet you also are trying to make a comparison to a contemporary issue of anti-Semitism anti and what happened in Virginia in particular. I don't know if you know this, but we were all the original um, AJC film festival. So we were founded 28 years ago, Atlanta being our um, sister festival back in the day. What an incredible festival. And you were given the Building Bridges Award in 2022. Um, and I think in particular, um, because there is such an incredible resonance with your film, bringing to life the history of prejudice. And, you know, there's a long history of Jews as white folks, right? We, we sort of adapted to the privilege and through ethnicity and lots of different things that happened in the 20th century. Your film has a very stomach churning moment of the torch bearing white nationalist chanting Jews will not replace us. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering, how did you come to decide that that was something to make relevant in your film? Sure, that's a great question, Pamela. And, you know, um, all, the, all, the, all the while when I was working on the film over the course of the couple of years or so that, that, that it took to make the film, um, I kind of always had in the back of my mind uh, what had transpired in Charlottesville uh, in the summer of 2017. Um, and for a couple of reasons. One, of course, those horrifying shots of those neo-Nazi white nationalists with their Nazi reminiscent torches shouting Jews will not replace us. But, but I was always keenly aware of, of that sort of juxtaposition with Monticello for people who are not familiar with the overall geography of that part of the country, uh, Monticello sits on a mountaintop uh, a few miles away uh, from downtown Charlottesville. Uh, Thomas Jefferson himself 
had a long history with the University of Virginia. He designed as the architect uh, the buildings at the University of Virginia. He's the, he's, he's, he's the father of the University of Virginia. Those, those white uh, nationalists were surrounding a statue of Thomas Jefferson uh, as, as part of that rally that was taking place that turned so horrifically tragic. Um, and so always in the back of my mind, I was kind of making that connection between what was going on uh, in Charlottesville in 2017 uh, and the story that I was telling uh, of a Jewish family and their relationship to Monticello. Um, and, 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 the, and there was overlap that even extended beyond that. So in the course of my research, and there's a, there's a brief reference to this in the film, uh, where uh, Naya Bates, who worked for many years at Monticello, uh, leading an oral history project in specifically focusing on the enslaved community. She reminds us in the film um, that, uh, that 2017 was not the first time that, uh, that white nationalists uh, rallied around uh, the Thomas Jefferson uh, in the name of white nationalism. And indeed, I had found uh, an old newspaper advertisement and articles going back to the 1920s, where shockingly, the Charlottesville branch of the Ku Klux Klan formally organized themselves. This is in early, the early 1920s uh, in, a, in, in a sort of weird, spooky midnight ceremony around the tombstone of Thomas Jefferson, right on the grounds of of Monticello. Um, and so those connections have always been there. Uh, and so I knew at some point there was going to be a way to, to make that connection. And, and I, I, it's, it's, it, it is a fairly dramatic moment in, in the film. And for me, by the way, as a filmmaker, it, that was a first for me because, um, because I have focused on historical documentaries. I've never actually made a film before that brings us right up to the present time. But I knew that here, uh, it, with a film that is talking so much about anti-Semitism, um, I, I really couldn't ignore the fact, uh, really almost as, a, as an unfortunate postscript to the story of the levies, that uh, right up to the present day, uh, that issue of anti-Semitism and racism, of course, is still with us. And in this case, uh, uh, literally surrounding Thomas Jefferson, almost within the shadow of the home he designed and loved so much, and the home uh, uh, that, of course, was saved and preserved by Jews, uh, all happening with these neo-Nazis uh, surrounding a statue of Thomas Jefferson uh, saying, uh, the Jews will not replace us. One, 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 one little addendum to that, the ultimate irony uh, as, as I point out in the film, that those neo-Nazis, those white nationalists, while they're surrounding that statue of Thomas Jefferson, shouting, Jews will not replace us, had no idea. And I discovered this while I was making the film, that that iconic statue of Thomas Jefferson, which stands outside, right outside of the rotunda of the University of Virginia, was made by a Jewish sculptor named Moses Ezekiel. Uh, you know, irony like that, you cannot make up. Uh, and, and I'm glad I had an opportunity to, to, to shine that light and to, to point out ultimately the, the absurdity of what was happening and the, and the sad absurdity of those neo-Nazis uh, and, their, and their horrifying anti-Semitism. Well, I think it's quite incredible how you've kind of uh, taken back the idea of what's going on with monuments in this country and actually revealed something historically, which is, you know, obviously the Jewish history of um, of of building um, sort of symbols of history. And that also sounds like that went unnoticed. I think it's very interesting that Levy was a Jeffersonian, right? He believed in the Jeffersonian ideal. And so I think this is the first time hearing about Jefferson somehow being reclaimed uh, by the white nationalists. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know a little bit about the prejudice factor, because I know that your research, there wasn't a lot for you to find out about what kind of prejudices of the day 
way, but your film does begin with that. And it, it, it sort of, can, can you speak a little bit to how it was, if at all, uh, the Levy family might have experienced prejudice sure. in the day? Sure. Uh, so again, let me divide that into the two different levies because there are very specific kinds of examples that Uriah Levy faced and then subsequently his nephew, uh, Jefferson Monroe Levy, who wound up owning Monticello considerably longer than his uncle Uriah. Uriah Levy, as I mentioned a few moments ago, had this long career in the Navy. Uh, and, and back then in the early years of the United States, um, as, as, uh, as Jonathan Sarna, the historian from Brandeis, points out in the film, uh, Jews in the Navy uh, was, was not a common occurrence, uh, a, a rare sight indeed. Uriah Levy, in fact, not only spends 50 years, uh, a, a rare thing for a Jew, but becomes the first Jewish Commodore, sort of comparable to the modern day rank of Admiral. But along the way, he definitely encounters a lot of anti-Semitism. But Uriah Levy is this tough, pugnacious guy, very, very proud to be Jewish. Uh, we're seeing a, a, photo, a, a painting of, of Uriah Levy. Uh, actually, we're also seeing a, a newspaper ad from the, 18, a newspaper article rather from the 1830s that announces uh, Uriah's uh, purchase of Monticello uh, in the 1830s. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about the kind of reaction Uriah would have received by virtue of his ownership of Monticello other than a few little snide references here and there. But we know with absolute certainty that Uriah, because he talks about it himself, and I quote from uh, his own writings in the film, that he was subject to really constant uh, anti-Semitism and attacks on him personally, simply because he was Jewish. He always stood up for himself. One of the things that um, I, um, uh, I uh, unfortunately had to leave on the cutting room floor for, for just because it didn't quite fit into the film, but at one point Uriah Levy actually fights a duel with a fellow naval officer who, uh, who insults him to his face for being Jew. He, basically, he calls him a dirty Jew. Uh, and, and words are exchanged. And, and, and given when this is happening in the early years of the 19th century, the two actually fight a duel over this. So you can imagine the kinds uh, of situations that might arise that would propel a guy like Uriah Levy. Things become even more pronounced when his nephew, uh, Jefferson Monroe Levy, comes to own Monticello beginning in the late 1870s and into the early years of the 20th century. And the, the film tells the story of a woman named Maude Littleton, who at one point launches a national campaign to take Monticello away from Jefferson Monroe Levy. She says it's all because she wants to see Monticello become a uh, either a government-owned or some kind of uh, a, a privately owned museum and shrine to, to, to Jefferson. But the subtext of Maude Littleton, who is very anti-Semitic, is basically she just does not like the idea that this Jewish family owns this sacred spot, Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello. Uh, and she spends a number of years uh, waging her campaign unsuccessful. Uh, but Jefferson Monroe Levy finds himself the subject of those same kinds of anti-Semitic attacks uh, that victimized his uncle uh, decades earlier. I wanted to ask a little bit about, you mentioned what you had to leave on the cutting room floor. And obviously you've done a ton of research and are so conversant in it, but I imagine you had to make some choices. Um, so I'm just sort of wondering, what are the bloopers? Or you know, what are the things <laughs> that, that you decided um, could not help tell the story or were dead ends, um, but might be really interesting to share with us today. Sure, great. Thank you for asking that because I love talking about the things that aren't in the film. So I, I mentioned the duel. Uh, the duel is a good example of that because I had all these great uh, notions of, of working with an animator to have some kind of fun animation of seeing Uriah, you know, rowing across the Delaware River um, the, the challenge with this fellow officer actually starts at an officer's ball in Philadelphia 
uh, fighting a duel was illegal back then in Pennsylvania, but it was completely legal in New Jersey. So they, they, they go across the river, not unlike Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, not too, not too many years before this is happening. Of course, we know, you know, we know what happened there. Uh, it didn't end well for, uh, for Alexander Hamilton. Um, uh, but, you know, the more I was when I was putting the film together with my associate producer, Lisa Stark, and, and my and my uh, film editor, Richard Levine, uh, you know, there are things that just kind of don't keep the story moving along. Uh, and part of the problem was the story of the duel. Uh, if I was able to tell it in like 10 or 12 seconds, it might have worked. But it got involved and it went on for like 30 or 40 seconds, which is an eternity in 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 film talk. So. That unfortunately had to end up on the cutting room floor. The, the one other thing I'll mention, uh, which I still kind of have pangs about, um, the Levy family uh, by the late 19th century, because they had been around for generations. I mean, Uriah Levy was already a fifth generation American. His nephew Jefferson Monroe Levy was a, was a sixth generation American. The Levy family had long roots and tentacles that spread out. And so at one point I had this family tree and I discovered that none other than Emma Lazarus, the 19th century poet from the Lower East Side of New York, who famously writes the words that are inscribed on the base of the Statue of Liberty that we all know, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. Emma Lazarus is a uh, is a distant cousin of the Levies. Well, when I just when I realized that, I thought, oh my God, I've got to get Emma into this film. It's it's the Statue of Liberty for God's sakes. It's Emma Lazarus. Well, again, you know, she doesn't show up until towards the end of the film, and uh, it, she just didn't work. But I, I I felt terrible leaving Emma on on the cutting room floor. But I, I always appreciate the opportunity to give. Uh, Emma, her do in conversations like this. I love that. Um, I'll ask one more cinematic question and maybe I'll ask Lisa if she has something else that's bubbled up for her. But, um, you know, it's interesting looking at the documentaries that we included this year in the film festival. I think we're showing Reckonings, we're showing, which is um, uh, Roberta Grossman's film. Um, and obviously as a, as a former AJC person that, you know, film is is very much red meat for, for my AJC um, supporters. Uh, but I but I really wanted to know, there's so much reenactment. You talked about animation and obviously we see a lot of animation in Holocaust documentaries, especially when you're dealing with difficult subjects. But did it ever cross your mind to do reenactment? Because it seems to be Savoy, I'm looking at three films that are documentaries or they're sort of docudramas ultimately, but yeah. I was curious as a filmmaker, what your perspective is on that genre. Sure, great. I'm gonna to try to be as tactful and diplomatic as I possibly can uh, in response because I'm, I've seen both Reckonings and Hotel Savoy. Uh, and, um, you know, here's the thing, Pamela, I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of full on reenactments in historical documentaries. In my first two films, in, in, uh, I, made a, I made a film called 50 Children, which is a story about a couple who rescued a group of children uh, from uh, Vienna, Austria. And then my second film that you mentioned, Holy Silence. In both of those films, my film editor and I decided that the, we were not going to do full-on reenactments. We were going to do what uh, what my film editor Ken Schneider uh, always lovingly referred to as dramatic touches. So um, what I mean by that is we had actors uh, reenacting scenes, but they were never shown in full figure or full face or speaking. They were close-ups. There was a woman polishing her nails. There was there was a couple sitting in front of a Gestapo officer at a desk, and you saw their hands, or you saw somebody typing a letter. Those things we did, but when it came to making the levies of Monticello, um, my editor and I decided that uh, here was a case where we didn't see the need uh, for dramatic purposes to really do any kind of reenactments. Uh, instead. We did a little bit of animation here and there, nothing, nothing over the top, but just, just as a way to bring something a little different visually. Um, so I don't know, um, just sort of from an aesthetic point of view, it's a, it's a tricky thing when you're making historical documentaries. And, and I've, made the, 
I've made the creative decision as a director and a producer to avoid full on reenactments. Um, but look, you know, uh, lots of other filmmakers have, and, 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 and in, in recent years, reenactments have become really quite uh, prevalent in lots and lots of documentaries and often very effectively so. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a fine line uh, and done well. I think it's a perfectly great tool uh, that filmmakers should use. Uh, and I've chosen a somewhat different route to try to sort of minimize that as a as part of the visual toolbox in the films that I make. Well, we have a couple of questions coming in. I have one last question, and I'll kick it over to Lisa after this. But I'm just curious. I I visited Monticello with my family. Uh, my in-laws were in Virginia for quite a while. I'm just curious. Um, have they accepted and built into the narrative of Monticello this history? Or have they used it as a site-specific location in order to do reenactment or to show your film in some site-specific way? How have they responded to the film? Sure. Um, long before I came along to, to make this film, uh, the folks at Monticello, uh, in, in specific, uh, the, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which is the the same nonprofit group that, that purchased Monticello from Jefferson Monroe Levy 100 years ago in 1923. Uh, that organization still owns and operates Monticello. In, in recent decades, now really going back to the 1980s, they've done a, a much better job than they did in the earlier years of recognizing the role that the Levy family played. Uh, indeed, for the first well, close to 60 years or, or, or about 60 years of the foundation's ownership of Monticello, uh, and, I, and I think I point this out in the film, uh, they basically disappeared the Levy family. They, they, they didn't want to acknowledge at all the role that this Jewish family played. Uh, and uh, But beginning in the 1980s, uh, th they've done a much better job, uh, in particular, uh, Uriah's mother, Rachel Phillips Levy, who's been buried right there at Monticello since she died in 1839. For years, that, that gravesite was completely abandoned and gone to weed. Uh, there is now uh, a, 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 much, uh, a much more uh, recent dedicated monument there. We're, we're seeing a photograph of the original tombstone. Right, lying directly in front of that tombstone is a much more modern uh, uh, a memorial, uh, and then there's some signage right outside of this gravesite area uh, that gives proper credit to, to the Levy family. Now, that said, um, I think most of us fully uh, understand and really can, can kind of accept the fact that uh, the vast majority, you know, 99% of the people who are going to Monticello are going there because this was Thomas Jefferson's home not because it, it, it was a home owned by the Levy family. So the docents who lead the tours, they don't go out of their way to talk about the levies, but nor do they shy away from it. And they're certainly conversant and, uh, and, and, and are able to address questions if asked. Um, and to that extent, I think the folks at Monticello have done a terrific job in recent years as they have, by the way, when it comes to fully telling the story of slavery at Monticello. Again, decades and decades ago, that was a verboten subject at Monticello. Uh, and certainly the issue of Thomas Jefferson having fathered children with Sally Hemings was something that you would never have heard uttered uh, by anybody associated with Monticello. And now it's definitely part of the narrative at Monticello as it well should be. Uh, and so uh, visitors to Monticello today really can get the full historical suite, good and bad. Uh, you know, as, as Dan Jordan, the, the former executive director of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation says in the film, you know, this is our history. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. We have to we have to embrace that history, uh, and and that's exactly what they've done all these decades later at Monticello. Amazing, Lisa. I understand you have a follow up, and then I'm going to um, go to Betsy, uh, Phyllis. Phyllis has two questions. So, and then uh, Ruth, I'll ask you um, if you'll unmute and ask aloud. So, go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I was curious about um, you know what the show in line of um, Pamela's question about what, when the film was shown to the Levy family, the current descendants, how they 
reacted and any follow-up relationship with them? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I, I was in touch with some of the descendants of the Levy family. Uh, there are two who appear in the film. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the older descendant, uh, Harley Lewis, uh, uh, passed away while I was making the film. Her son, Richard, uh, is in the film. Uh, and, uh, and a number of members of the Levy family now have seen the film. You know, not too surprisingly, they're, they're delighted. Uh, but they've been delighted for many years now, uh, going back to uh, the book that Mark Leapson wrote, the book that Mel Urofsky wrote, and indeed uh, what has happened at Monticello itself. So again, in the film, uh, I, th there are a couple of photographs of, of members of the Levy family, the extended Levy family um, at Monticello, and, and really they, they have been embraced warmly at Monticello itself. Uh, a few months back, we had the opportunity to show the film uh, at Monticello, uh, which was also for me just just a just a great honor to be able to share the film there with members of their board of trustees, with some invited guests at Monticello. Uh, I think there are some plans to uh, continue to show the film from from time to time at Monticello. And again, to their credit, I think it shows really the good faith uh, uh, on the part of the foundation, uh, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation to, after all these years, to really fully embrace this story. They know, they're fully aware that this magnificent structure, this, this, this architectural gem that Thomas Jefferson himself designed would not exist. It would have fallen down uh, centuries ago, decades ago now, were it not for the dedicated efforts of, of the Levy family. Uh, they appreciate that, they know that, and, uh, and they now fully embrace that as part of the, of the history. All that said, when you go to Mon Monticello these days, uh, uh, you're not going to see artifacts related to the levees. You're not going to see that uh, as I show in the film, that, that full-length portrait of Uriah Levy that once hung in the hallway at Monticello. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a somewhat humorous reference to a pair of, two pairs of carved lions uh, that Jefferson Monroe Levy had, had purchased in Europe and installed on the grounds. You're not going to see those at Monticello. Monticello today is designed to look the way it was when Thomas Jefferson was there. And I think we could all understand that. Um, but the Levy family and their history and their long association with Monticello, I, I always like to remind people that the Levies owned Monticello longer than Thomas Jefferson and his family. Uh, so that legacy is now fully restored uh, and happily is, is a significant part of the Monticello story. Amazing. I think yeah. you know, it's it's interesting. I think about Aviva Kempner's film about Rosenwald and how money can really get in the way of family history. Um, obviously, the Rosenwald family did not know anything about their uncle who had created these incredible schools because he gave away all his money. Yeah. And in this instance, uh, you have uh, the shame of uh, something that went into disrepair and obviously had to be sold. So I'm going to go to uh, Betsy Schneier's question. Hi, Betsy. Um, and uh, Betsy, she says, I haven't seen the film yet, but I'm anxious to see it because my late mother was born in the South. Her dad was an Orthodox rabbi in Greenwood, Mississippi. My grandfather hated living there due to segregation in the 1920s and left, but he did navigate both the racism and the anti-Semitism. He wouldn't talk much about it. Um, so the question I think we're getting to is how hard did you have to work to get the Levy family to open up about all of this um, and the strains that are permeating daily life for Southern Jews? Sure. Well, um, spoiler alert, that's, that's an easy question to answer because uh, the Levies were not a Southern Jewish family, to be perfectly honest. They were a Northern Jewish family. Uriah was born in Philadelphia uh, when he wasn't at sea, as he was through much of his naval career. Uh, he lived in New York City, as did his nephew, Jefferson Monroe Levy. Uh, Jefferson Monroe Levy was born in New York. He died in New York. He spent most of his life in New York. He was a three-term congressman uh, 
uh, from, from a New York district. So uh, I, I always am quick to point out that even though this family now is connected with Monticello, obviously in the South, in Virginia, they never lived there full time and they themselves were, uh, would hardly consider themselves a Southern Jewish family. Now, again, that said, as I mentioned at the outset, Uriah Levy, who did own Monticello prior to the Civil War, uh, uh, did, have, did have slaves, did have enslaved people working for him. And so uh, here was a man who embraced religious liberty, who revered Thomas Jefferson because of Jefferson's advocacy and champion championing of religious liberty also uh, lived that contradiction of owning other human beings. Um, but in terms of the question, in terms of uh, how this family kind of dealt with those paradoxes, they basically did not have to deal with that because um, they never lived full-time in Monticello. Uh, and so they, 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 they therefore were never full-time residents of the South. Uh, they came and went, they would spend summers or holidays or what have you at Monticello, uh, but they were, uh, they were a Northern family. And indeed, during the Civil War, uh, Monticello was confiscated for a few years by the Confederacy, not because Uriah Levy was Jewish, but because he was a Northerner. And one of the laws of the Confederacy allowed the confiscation of Northern owned property uh, in the Southern states. Amazing. Well, I just want to say Betsy Trifecta here, both a, a past Washington State Jewish Historical Society board member, was the president uh, of the AJC when the film festival was founded, and has been obviously a supporter of both of our organizations. So thanks, Betsy, for your question. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, um, ask Phyllis's question. So Phyllis asks, uh, the film is very interesting, first of all, she says, and wondering if you can expound at all on Thomas Jefferson's relationship with any Jewish people, if you know. Yeah, you know, I was very interested in that, uh, Pamela, and I did some research in that. Uh, I talked to a number of people. I was looking at primary sources. Um, and um, the, the best we can say is that Jefferson clearly knew uh, some Jews, particularly some Jewish merchants who lived uh, in Charlottesville when he was living uh, as he did uh, several months of the year or many months of the year at, at Monticello, uh, there was an account of, uh, of, of a Jewish merchant who sold D Thomas Jefferson some goods, some books, some other household goods. Um, but even though we're talking about uh, the man, Jefferson, who wrote famously wrote the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberty, there's not a whole lot in the record that, that lends us, that leads us to believe that Jefferson had close personal relations with Jews. Uh, and unfortunately, and, I, and I, can't, I can't quote it directly, but there are some writings of Jefferson, uh, and I believe some of this is in his long correspondence with his longtime friend, uh, for a while political enemy, and then lifelong friend again, John Adams, where Jefferson actually has some somewhat disparaging things to say uh, uh, about Judaism. Um, so again, Jefferson was always a man of contradictions. The man who writes the Declaration of Independence winds up owning 607 human beings. The man who writes the Statute of Religious Liberty, uh, Religious Freedom, uh, writes disparagingly uh, at, at times of, of Judaism and other religions. Um, so uh, we don't really know too much uh, about his personal relations with Jews, other than uh, it was probably fairly limited. If for no other reason, then we're also talking about a time in history where there are actually very, very few Jews living uh, in places like Charlottesville and other places where Thomas Jefferson himself would have lived. So he would have had very few opportunities to really have any interactions whatsoever with Jews. Great, thank you. That was a really great answer. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute Ruth. Ruth, are you there? Ruth Sasson? Sassoon, excuse me. Ruth, are you there? Hold on, you're unmuted. Go ahead and unmute yourself. I was wondering about the outcome of the duel. <laughs> Very good. Great. That I can tell you about. The duel, the duel that did not make the film that went up on the cutting room floor 
Um, so the story is that 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 uh, Uriah Levy and this fellow officer, who whose name I have buried somewhere in my notes, but I can't recall it, uh, across the Delaware River into New Jersey. Uriah Levy is not all that keen on fighting this duel, um, but you know he's holding up his honor. He's been insulted as a dirty Jew, uh, and and guns are drawn. Uh, the story is, and we don't know how much of this is apocryphal, how much is true, uh, but the story is that the other officer shoots first, uh, misses Uriah Levy, and at that point, Uriah feels the need to shoot back, but deliberately aims high, uh, thinking, okay, that's the end of it. Shots have been exchanged. We can all you know, go home with our honor intact. But again, the story is, is that uh, the other fellow uh, keeps keeps shooting uh, and uh, and keeps missing. And finally, Uriah Levy says, "Enough of this!" Uh, takes aim, shoots the guy, kills him on sight. Um, and then the postscript is: uh, even though dueling is technically legal in New Jersey, uh, Uriah Levy is still brought up on charges of homicide, or at least second degree murder, or manslaughter, or, or what have you and is actually brought to trial and acquitted on grounds of self-defense. So you can argue that as barbaric as dueling was back in that day, at least justice was served in the sense that uh, Uriah uh, himself uh, was, uh, was acquitted uh, on the grounds that uh, this whole thing was really not of his doing, and he did whatever he could to avoid any kind of mortal injuries to himself or his fellow officer and and uh, and 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 went off a free man. That is an incredible story, and I can see why it, you <laughs> had to work way, so hard way, to not put that in the film because that's way 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 too complicated, Pamela. But a good but a good story. Well, Phyllis has one last question, and then I'll ask if anyone else wants to speak up and raise your hand. If not, I'll throw a few things in the chat so that you can continue to buy tickets. We're showing this film through the 26th. The recording of this conversation will be up on our YouTube channel, and I'll put that in the link as well so you can share that with people. Um, and then Lisa will have a final question. So Phyllis uh, Friedman, it's a little bit of a long one. So um, when Jefferson Levy uh, took over Monticello, he found a caretaker, and some of the former slaves were living Living on the property, I think. Uh, what will the condition? What were the conditions for those workers? And also, the story about the gatekeeper was so interesting, and we love the idea that their great, great, great question mark grandson became a legislator for the same district as Chief Thomas Jefferson. How amazing! It would be good to know some of the details. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a multi-layered uh, question. Uh, all great questions. All great issues. I'm not sure, I'm trying to think, I, I'm not sure that we know whether there were ever actually former enslaved people still at Monticello by the time Jefferson Monroe Levy comes to own Monticello in 1879. Um, uh, I'm a little unclear on that. We, we do know that there were African Americans who were now employed by Jefferson Monroe Levy as caretakers, as groundskeepers, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as the film points out, some of those people had uh, relatives who, who, who had been enslaved uh, at Monticello, some actually going back to Thomas Jefferson's time, and also others uh, when uh, Uriah Levy uh, uh, owned the place. Um, and indeed, uh, that terrific story of the gatekeeper uh, that is told by uh, one of his uh, descendants um, the, the, the gatekeeper refers to a, a house uh, right on the property that Jefferson Monroe Levy had constructed at, at the entrance to Monticello, uh, and uh, somebody was hired to be the gatekeeper that would allow people onto the property, charge a dime or a quarter to allow them onto the grounds, with, which Jefferson Monroe Levy always allowed to do. Uh, and it's that great story uh, of of that descendant who's 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 in the film, he's now a corporate lawyer, uh, who uh, some years ago uh, was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates, the lower the lower house in the Virginia legislature. Uh, so here, we not not only do we have a descendant of of this African American person who who also was descended from from slaves, 
Um, but he's also uh, representing the exact same district from Charlottesville that Thomas Jefferson had represented when he, when Jefferson uh, uh, served in uh, the, I think it was then called the House of Burgesses uh, in Virginia prior to uh, the United States becoming a country. So it was one of the, it was one of the great little historical facts uh, that also I think goes to really the heart of the story of Monticello, how you have in, in, in telling the story of a house, you're able to talk about the history of slavery, the history of anti-Semitism, the long history of racism in this country, the long history of the horrific treatment of African-Americans on this property, but also, also to be honest, uh, really the promise of what was best about both the founding fathers and those that came after them. Um, so again, I've, I, I've, mentioned, I've mentioned before the, the paradox of the man who writes the Declaration of Independence also being a slaveholder. Uh, and yet it's because of that promise of political rights and political freedoms that you have all these generations later. Uh, this this African-American man uh, serving uh, in the same elected body uh, that Thomas Jefferson had served in uh, two centuries earlier. Well, perhaps there's something in that story that gives us all a lot of hope. Um, <laughs> So I wanted to just pass it over to Lisa and then one final question and uh, Lisa, go ahead. Lisa, you're on mute, go ahead. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, this has just been fascinating. So really appreciate it. Um, very quickly, I'm just curious what, you know, if any other books are gonna fall your way or you're <laughs> gonna, you know, take a look and, you know, what other sources you might have for or if you're working on anything currently or what you might be working on in the future. Sure, well, I kind of gave it away a little bit. Uh, so uh, uh, earlier on in the conversation, I mentioned very briefly uh, the Jewish sculptor, Moses Ezekiel, who had made that statue of Thomas Jefferson uh, at the University of Virginia where the neo-Nazis had surrounded, were surrounding back in 2017 in, in Charlottesville. I, uh, Lisa, I had never heard of Moses Ezekiel, but I learned a little bit about him and he's got a fascinating story. He does come from a Southern Jewish family. He was born before the Civil War. He actually fought uh, as a young cadet from the Virginia Military Institute in a Civil War battle. And then he goes on to have a long, internationally famous career as a sculptor in Rome, Italy, of all places. Uh, and he's got a great story. Um, there's some controversy because among the works of art that he created over the years turn out to be a number of Confederate memorials around the country, including one right there at Arlington National Cemetery uh, in Washington, D.C. And so the more I learned about Moses, the more I thought, Maybe there's a film. So uh, so I'm working on that now. Uh, we'll see where it goes. But uh, once again, uh, I love the idea of telling a pretty little known story that I think will allow me to tell a broader story uh, about, uh, about some of these issues, including some of the same issues that we've been talking about uh, in this conversation, but now introducing film audiences to uh, to this, uh, to this uh, wonderful, flamboyant, interesting, fascinating guy, uh, Moses, uh, Moses Ezekiel. We'll see, we'll see where it goes. I'm well, really excited. I'm excited thank, about it. Thank you so much for that. I mean, thank you also for being on our pop-up history happy hour. Um, thank you to Pamela, um, just because uh, we're thrilled to have historical films um, in the running for in the Seattle Jewish Film Festival and for all the work she does. But Stephen, I mean, you've been tremendous. And I know our community is so appreciative of your coming on. And go ahead, Pamela. It's, right. been a, it's, been a great, it's been a great pleasure. And I want to thank you all for allowing me to be part of the festival this year. Thank you. I'm so glad. Before we just say goodbye for everybody for today, I just wanted to ask Stephen, have we let left anything of this conversation on the cutting room floor? Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Because Lisa stole my last question, which means she's very good at her job. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I always like to leave things on a high note. It, I, I can't think we've covered a lot of ground uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted and I hope uh, people who have seen the film enjoy it. 
And I hope others who haven't yet seen the film will avail themselves of the opportunity. Uh, and I look forward to hearing uh, more reactions and responses to the film. So thank you.